you very much, Ronnie, and thank you very much for this nice introduction. My name is Ofrit Barbachar. I have a background in physiotherapy and I have a master's degree in biomedical sciences where I studied uh, pain processing in patients with myofascial pain. And today I would like to talk to you about CPM just a little bit. Uh, the, the subjects for today would be a methodology of CPM and how it's done around the world, uh, CPM results and what may be interesting about them, um, the correlation between CPM and clinical outcomes, and a few of uh, medoc solutions uh, in assisting you to perform CPM. And at the end, uh, we'll summarize everything just uh, for a very, very short uh, while and then uh, let you ask some questions. If we don't get to your questions, uh, we'll um, promise to um, be in touch through email and, uh, and try to answer your, your questions via email. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. Let's start. So condition pain modulation, what is it? Uh, when we talk about condition pain modulation, we talk about the phenomenon of pain inhibits pain. So when there is one pain source and another pain source is introduced and uh, the first pain source is felt uh, less uh, intense. And uh, this has, um, has been researched extensively and they found that this is a bulbospinal uh, a spinal bulbal spinal pathway that's involved in this uh, endogenous descending pain inhibition. And uh, when uh, we talk about CPM or condition pain modulation, we talk about uh, the protocol that we use to elicit the body's reaction in descending pain inhibition and our attempts to map this reaction, measure it, and compare it to others. So let's talk about terminology. Before the year of 2010, there were many, many different terms that were uh, used and they were used uh, once like that and the other time, uh, another time like that. And diffuse noxious inhibitory controls was actually the term that was used for this phenomenon in animal models. And then when uh, adopting it to people, people were talking about diffuse noxious inhibitor controls lack reaction. And this has become a mouthful and uh, therefore, uh, several researchers and leading uh, physici uh, physicians and uh, pain specialists come, came together and uh, said, we need to have nomenclature that we can all agree upon and that we can, that we can all use so they can all talk about the same thing. Uh, so um, they agreed upon conditioned pain modulation for the uh, phenomenon and for the protocol. And when talking about the protocol, they talked of test stimulus, and that will be the stimulus uh, that we give at least twice, once a standalone, and another time uh, as um, under the influence of the conditioning stimulus. And this is the stimulus that would affect the intensity that is uh, perceived of the test stimulus. So from now on in this presentation, I will talk about CPM, and I will talk about test stimulus and conditioning stimulus, and uh, we'll continue our conversation under these terms. So uh, CPM methodology, and, and this is a very, very interesting topic because CPM is conducted around the world in many, many places, but uh, it's done uh, under many different conditions. And uh, this is interesting, but this may also be a hindrance. Um, in 2014, uh, some of the same pain researchers, by the way, uh, came together to see whether we can come to a consensus on recommendations on how to conduct CPM. Um, and this is important in order so that, that we can uh, all, if we all use the same methodology, then we can compare our results much better. And uh, they suggested that uh, for, um, for the testimus, a tonic testimus should be used of uh, VAS uh, 40, uh, visual analog scale 40 out of 100, or a descending test stimulus used of uh, VAS 40 out of 100 um, that uh, they suggested using different modalities of the test stimuli together. So maybe a thermal and mechanical at different body sites and at least 10 minutes apart. And they uh, um, also recommended uh, preferably doing, uh, for instance, the test pain on the hand and the, co the conditioning on the contralateral leg, but having the test and the conditioning stimulus being uh, um, apart uh, as, as it comes to body sites. And a conditioning stimulus of a cold bath uh, of at least uh, VAS 20 for both paradigms was suggested. 
uh, and uh, they also recommended the sequential paradigm because they wanted to uh, refrain as much as possible from um, distraction bias during the test. Re with regard to the notation of the results, uh, inhibition would be a negative uh, notation, so that would be a minus, and uh, the more negative it would be, the more effective the CPM is supposed to be, and facilitation would be also a, a, a positive notation, and that would mean that uh, the CPM efficacy uh, is, is low or non-existent or ineffective, if you want to call it that way. But uh, irrespective of these uh, recommendations, um, practice is different, and, um, and this um, review by uh, Niren Yernitsky, uh, they found different uh, labs doing different um, protocols, and uh, they found that test stimulus often is done with or either contact heat with the thermode, or for instance, uh, pressure algometry. Uh, you can also use um, uh, electrical pain threshold or nociceptive withdrawal reflex, and in later years, uh, also the cuff uh, pressure algometry has joined. And uh, with regard to, to the conditioning stimulus, that could also be, for instance, a thermode or a hot bath or a cold press test, cold bath, and uh, also cuff pressure algometry has been used. And then uh, to look at a CPM, we can either uh, lo um, mostly look at the ratings, but you can also look at, um, you know, EEG, for instance. With regard to test stimulus, and, and now I'll go just a little bit into uh, what type of test stimuli are available and what people do. Uh, you can use, for instance, a threshold stimulus, and then uh, this is often used in, um, in pressure pain thresholds, and then you can see that uh, you have a specific threshold for a specific person, and uh, as soon as the, you do the test again under the influence of the conditioning stimulus, you'll see it with a positive, uh, you know, with an effective CPM, that the threshold will rise. So uh, a person will uh, press on the button a little bit later, it will start to hurt just a little bit later than it did before. And that would be the CPM effect, the, the rise of the threshold. Um, you can also do a super threshold stimulus, and in this case, you will probably want to calibrate it to that specific person. So you probably want to try several, for instance, uh, heat stimuli and see what type of heat stimulus causes this person to uh, rate this stimulus as VAS60, for instance. VAS60 is very often used more often than VAS40, by the way. Uh, using, by the way, VAS60 and VAS40 is um, it's not by accident because uh, if you use, uh, for instance, a lower VAS, you'll uh, bump into the floor effect. So you want to be uh, a little bit higher in order to see a CPM effect. So in this case, uh, let's say that we uh, calibrated the uh, temperature to the patient and we know that this patient, his pain 60 is at 46 and a half degrees. And then uh, we give 46 and a half degrees, the patient rates their pain. We introduce the conditioning stimulus and have the test stimulus come in again, and now this same test stimulus is uh, rated as VAS20, and our CPM effect, which is an effective CPM, is a VAS minus 40. A test stimulus could be tonic or phasic, so it could be an elongated stimulus, uh, for instance, 30 seconds, or uh, in, I know in Canada they do uh, 120 seconds, and then you have the uh, participant rated along uh, the stimulus, so it, in, at different time points or continuously rating it with a computerized visual analog scale. Uh, but you can also uh, have a phasic stimulus and have the uh, participants rated for each stimulus and take the average of that and uh, compare it to the average of the stimuli under the conditioning stimulus. Another nice uh, way to do a test stimulus could be a patient controlled super threshold stimulus. So we uh, calibrate uh, to know what uh, type of uh, super threshold stimulus would cause a specific level of pain. And then we let the uh, patient uh, control the uh, stimulus intensity. And we just say, we, I want you to stay at the same pain level, but you can control the uh, temperature by pressing uh, yes or no on the uh, response unit. And I just want to show you what such a thing would look like in our software. So now we press uh, start. Our target temperature you see on the top is 45 degrees. That's where we're going. 
And as soon as we'll uh, reach 45 degrees, we'll tell the patient, and now I want you to start pressing the button, yes and no, in order to increase or decrease the temperature. When they press only once, the temperature will be increased or decreased uh, by uh, um, 0.1 degree. However, when they press continuously, the temperature will, will, will be increased or decreased by the uh, pace that was pre-programmed by the person who is doing the test. So you can do five degrees per second, you can do 10 degrees per second. It really depends on the type of device that you have and, um, and what your uh, paradigm is and what, what, what you're looking for. So you can see that you have a very, very sensitive and a, a very a, a high time resolution uh, map of what's going on in this patient's body. And you have like some kind of an inverted uh, VAS score because you're not asking a patient to raise, but you're asking him to stay at the same pain level. And I think this is a very interesting way of looking at uh, the test pain. Let me just... And uh, this is has been used by uh, uh, Suracek and, uh, and 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 colleagues in the Belgrist lab in uh, in in, in Belgrist in Switzerland, and they actually use the search method as one of the CPM test stimuli, and they used several test stimuli. You can see that they used uh, um, also pressure pain threshold, the nociceptive withdrawal reflex, and the conditioning stimulus was a cold water bath. And you can see uh, on the bottom left side. Uh, that uh, in the graph, uh, the pre um, the pre conditioning uh, temperature uh, was lower versus the post conditioning uh, temperature. Uh, in 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 this case, it increased. So this is a nice way of looking at the testing. Use by the way. Now let's look at conditioning stimulus. And uh, we you remember that uh, there was a recommendation to use a sequential a stimulus. So having uh, like the one in the bottom a test stimulus then having the conditioning stimulus, and then having the, con the test stimulus again after the conditioning stimulus uh, uh, is done. We know that the conditioning stimulus ha can have a lasting effect for another uh, several minutes. So um, this would be an interesting um, uh, paradigm to do. However, most labs choose to do the parallel uh, paradigm that you see on the top having the conditioning stimulus uh, start and coincide with the secondary test stimulus. And um, we'll look into that a little bit and see uh, whether it matters, yes or no. So I want to cite Sirocek again, because they used also a pressure pain threshold as one of their mm, test pains. And you can see that on the right-hand side, uh, they found that pressure pain threshold uh, was increased uh, indeed, uh, during the conditioning stimulus. However, in the most dark color of blue, you can see that after the conditioning uh, stimulus was done, the, the pressure pain threshold did not significantly uh, change if we compare it to the pre-conditioning uh, test stimulus. So this is a very interesting finding, and they found this also something that is remarkable. And, and therefore, they started a little bit of a, um, a literature search and looked at other um, studies where they uh, compared parallel and sequential CPM effects with, PP, uh, with pressure pain thresholds and uh, cold bath conditioning stimulus. And they actually found that in many of those studies, um, the uh, sequential CPM effect was much lower um, with pressure pain threshold. So this is something to keep in mind. This um, study uh, by Rezicht out of the Hans Hogeschool in Groningen, the, ne the Netherlands, uh, they looked at several uh, options. Uh, they had a, a paradigm in which uh, a, a pressure pain threshold and, and heat uh, st uh, stimulus uh, were combined and they had a conditioning stimulus at VAS40 uh, of a cold pressure test. And then they had another experiment of pressure pain threshold and heat stimulus with a higher intensity conditioning stimulus. And then they had a pressure pain threshold uh, alone uh, versus the higher conditioning stimulus. And they wanted to see whether it matters if you use 
two or uh, one uh, test stimuli and whether it matters uh, what the conditioning intensity is. And by the way, they also looked at parallel versus sequential for all of these three uh, paradigms. And they uh, found that in the absolute CPM effect, so we, uh, when we look at absolute pain ratings or when we uh, look at absolute, uh, for instance, a kilopascal change uh, in the pressure pain threshold, they did not find any significant differences between the paradigms in either the thermal or the pressure pain stimuli. However, in the relative CPM effect, so when we calculate it as a percentage of the baseline value, then uh, they found that the, in the sequential design in blue, that's the one that you can see on the bottom, it had they had a lower CPM effect than the parallel design when the test stimuli were presented as a neck and at the shoulder, um, uh, and at the lower leg and not at the forearm. Uh, but they did not find uh, any significant effect for design, so the conditioning stimulus intensity or the dual stimulus CPM versus the, only the pressure stimuli. How much does it matter uh, to have a very intense conditioning stimulus ver uh, versus not so intense conditioning stimulus? Well, this is an interesting question, which has been answered, uh, I think, several times already. Um, first of all, I would like to cite uh, uh, Nir out of the Technion here in Israel, and he looked at a different intensity conditioning stimuli and, um, and also their rating. So these are hot bath of the, uh, 44 and a half degrees for the mild stimulus, 45 and a half degrees for the uh, moderate stimulus and 46 and a half degrees for the uh, intense stimulus. And you, you can see the difference, what the difference a degree makes. And um, he found that um, the mild stimulus uh, did not uh, cause any uh, significant CPM effect. However, the moderately and the intensely painful uh, stimuli um, had an, an, a CPM effect, but it did not differ significantly one from the other. He also found that the conditioning uh, stimulus intensity, so that would be the temperature, uh, was um, more important than the conditioning stimulus pain that it evoked. And that's an, also an interesting finding. A few years before that, uh, Granot out of the uh, Haifa University here in Israel um, looked at uh, the intensity of the conditioning stimulus. So she gave different temperatures of bath, 12, 15, 18, 33, 44, and 46 and a half degrees, um, and looked at uh, which temperature uh, caused uh, an CPM effect and, and, and uh, what uh, was the level of rating of uh, these uh, conditioning stimuli. And she found that uh, both the 12 degrees and the 46 and a half degrees uh, gave a, a good conditioning um, effect. Um, uh, and both of them were rated an average higher than fast 20. All of the conditioning stimuli that were rated lower than fast 20 did not have a significant CPM effect. So this is also something to keep in mind. You can use hot and you can use cold as long as it's painful enough. How much does it matter? The conditioning stimulus, I mean. Uh, Graf, uh, out of the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, Germany, uh, took uh, several of the studies conducted in their lab and affiliated labs and uh, put them all together. Uh, some of them are unpublished, as you can say, and uh, looked at what uh, part of CPM causes the variation that we see in CPM. And they actually found that uh, conditioning stimulus intensity has a very small uh, part uh, to play, 4.7% 4, 4 of the variation in CPM, and the paradigm has 3%, and then also the sex has a very small part to play, and the age is a small part to play. And then there are the inter-individual differences. These are the differences that we're interested in. What makes people tick? What makes me different from you? What makes my makeup have a, a good CPM and your makeup have not a good CPM effect? Um, and found that those differences that we are after when we are looking at CPM uh, contribute about 34 and some percent. And then there are all the unexplained differences that we really don't know uh, where they come from. They could be uh, the, the gender or the gender or how pleasant the person explaining the test to me. 
uh, is for me. Or uh, they could be how clear the test instructions are for me. Or they could be that the fact that I fought with my husband this morning and I'm in a bad mood and this will affect my CPM as well. And these are many, many unexplained and unknown um, variables uh, that still need to be uh, elucidated and that contribute to the variability that we see in research in CPM. And then, yeah, the results. So we talked about variability. We talked about having a good CPM and having bad CPM. Why isn't having an effective CPM good? Well, uh, Lewis uh, and colleagues did an interesting uh, review and uh, looked at uh, studies where uh, a CPM was conducted on both uh, healthy and uh, chronic uh, pain patients. And in general, uh, their um, meta-analysis found that uh, the tendency is for patients to have an impaired uh, CPM and uh, for controls uh, to have um, an effective CPM. And that's very simply said, and I really would recommend uh, reading this paper because it's still very much cited. CPM can be uh, less effective in uh, idiopathic pain disorders. For instance, pharmalgia, ir irritable uh, ball syndrome, temporal mandibular disorder, also a non-susceptive pain like osteoarthritis and whiplash associated disorders, as well as in neuropathic pain, for instance, diabetic neuropathy and Parkinson's disease and chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy. And then we asked ourselves, um, is it uh, that because uh, patients have chronic pain that they have less effective CPM, or is it because they have uh, less effective CPM that they have chronic pain? And this is quite a chicken and an egg story. And um, there's still uh, discussions about that. There are uh, There is already evidence accumulating uh, toward this and toward that. Um, Yelnitsky himself proposes that uh, CPM is not engraved in stone. That it may change over time and, it, uh, un and under the influence of, for instance, painful events, uh, but also under the influence of pain relief and pharmaceutical treatments. And we have, uh, we see indeed um, in literature uh, that uh, CPM may change uh, under, for instance, pain relief of a total hip uh, arthro uh, arthroplasty. But then uh, when uh, do we develop CPM? And this is interesting. There is very little studies done uh, uh, using CPM on uh, pediatric uh, population. And in this case, uh, I have to uh, disappoint you because this is not a pediatric population that you see here in uh, this slide. This is a slide of the uh, Apicure cohort study. And they recruited all infants born prematurely before the gestational week 26 across 20, 276 maternity wards in the UK and Ireland. And, um, and these are infants that were born in 1995. And then in, 19, uh, in 2018, they published uh, this study that they did on these infants and uh, term-born controls um, that uh, have meanwhile become young adults. And they wondered uh, the fact that somebody is born is so early in such um, maybe traumatic circumstances, uh, circumstances um, uh, undergoing uh, painful, uh, um, painful interventions in early life, would this affect uh, CPM? And they found uh, that in uh, in general, no, it did not affect CPM because you can see in the top right graph that uh, in extremely preterm males and females and turn born. Uh, males uh, and, and term-born females did not differ significantly in their uh, CPM efficacy. However, within the extremely preterm females, they found that there was a subgroup of females that could not withstand the conditioning stimulus of the cold bath and withdrew their hand uh, very early. And also that these same females had uh, quite a significantly low uh, baseline pressure pain thresholds and had almost no CPM effect. So uh, first of all, we can conclude that uh, possibly a CPM uh, may not be um, influenced by uh, such early 
youth um, um, circumstances or events. Um, of course, this is based on one study, what I'm saying. Uh, but in, another thing that I would like you to keep in mind that also within your study group, you should look at the dispersal of your results and, and consider those, because this is something that is worth a while um, researching. Why, what makes these females uh, just a little bit more different from their counterparts who were also preterm born? Another study in pediatrics this time, and these were 103, 33 healthy children by Tsao and the UCLA in the United States. And they looked at children in the ages between 8 and 17 years old. And uh, you can see on the uh, that uh, in general, these children had a CPM effect, and you can see that in the bottom right graph, where you can see the lines going down, general conditioning stimulus. And the top right graph is most interesting to me because this is the difference between the younger children and the older children. And the younger children were the, those between uh, 8 uh, and uh, 11, and the older children were those between uh, 12 and 17. And uh, uh, all the children here in gray had a more effective CPM as compared to the younger children. So we can uh, maybe um, construct from this that uh, we develop our CPM ability uh, throughout our childhood. And this is something that, that I think is interesting. With regard to sex, I would like to cite uh, this huge study, the Dan Fund uh, study in Denmark. Uh, where they uh, actually took a large uh, general population cohort and uh, looked at many, many different variables. And the total cohort, I think, was around 7,000 pe uh, people. Uh, but for the uh, CPM, they used about 2,000, only 2,000 uh, participants. And, uh, you know, when you have such a huge data set, then you can look at the uh, differences between sexes and ages and and, and, and BMI, and, and this is definitely interesting. And they did find uh, a significant difference uh, in uh, sex, in the sense that females were uh, had less affected, uh, effective CPM, and this is something uh, that, um, that has uh, been shown in other studies as well. And, and so um, this is something also to keep in mind. However, uh, you should take into account that uh, among females in the general populations, there is uh, much more chronic pain than among males. The, the prevalence of chronic pain among females is much higher. And uh, I'm not sure how much they controlled for chronic pain. They had a, a questionnaire in which they asked the participants to uh, talk about their pain in the past 12 months, but they didn't talk about whether it's acute or chronic and, and the duration of pain. And of course, in these type of studies, there's also selection bias in the sense that not everybody is volunteering uh, to um, participate in such a study, but you can say that about almost any study that has to do with pain. Uh, but something to keep in mind and, and interesting results. Now that we talked about sex, Let's talk about gender, and I would like to cite Strath out of the University of Alabama in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, who looked at temporal summation and CPM in cisgender men, cisgender women, and transgender women. And if these terms are new to you, I would like to explain that cisgender men were uh, men that were born biologically male and identify as uh, male. However, uh, transgender women were born biologically male but identify as female and may be going through their uh, process of transformation. And these are uh, actually patients living with uh, HIV and chronic pain. And they found that there were significant differences in, for instance, super threshold heat ratings between the transgender women, the cisgender women, and the cisgender men, as there were no differences between the transgender women and the cisgender women, but there were differences between them and the cisgender men. So this is interesting uh, how, um, you know, how you identify yourself has uh, something to do how you, uh, with how you perceive um, super threshold heat. However, CPM was conducted with a uh, pressure pain threshold and a cold pressure test, and they did not find any differences in baseline pressure pain threshold nor in CPM effect be between these three groups. So, uh, and it's a small study, but very interesting. 
uh, and of course uh, an interesting population as well. Coming to women's health, in the past there was some reluctance to include women in medical research, why women have uh, varying uh, hormonal levels and you know can mess up the data. Well, um, fortunately, uh, we're past that. Uh, women are included in medical research, but it is something to think about. Do hormonal levels affect RCPM? Uh, in this uh, review by Hermans, so this is a Belgian group. Um, they they included several studies, but they had they found six papers which investigate the influence of menstrual phase on CPM response. And four out of these six studies, there was no difference uh, found in the CPM effect between the menstrual phases. While two studies found more efficacious CPM during the ovulatory phase as compared to the luteal phase or the men's follicular phase. And then, well, a uh, uh, fact of life is uh, many uh, women use uh, oral contraceptives and they found that out of the three studies assessed, only one found that women not using contraceptives have more efficacious uh, CPM than those that do use them. And um, this is when they specifically tested the pressure pain threshold that the masseter muscle uh, with the cold press con as conditioning. So another interesting, uh, event something that you should take into account, should not take into account to your consideration. And then an, a huge uh, a question around the world, of course, is race. Uh, we see differences in how uh, anesthetics are prescribed to different racial groups and minorities, and there are disparities uh, in uh, in these matters. And in that case, is it's important and interesting to look at uh, what effect does race have uh, on CPM. And NUG uh, from the National University out of Singapore uh, in, in a study in 2019 tested CPM in two ethnic groups uh, in Singapore, uh, Indians and Chinese, uh, because they, um, as they cite uh, Indians in, uh, in Singapore uh, are prescribed more um, anesthetics and uh, and there is some uh, more sensitivity to pain according to them and uh, what they found in their study was that CPM was less efficient in Indians in, in absolute numbers where Chinese also had longer duration of the ability to withstand the cold pain uh, of the conditioning stimulus and they also find that a larger percentage of Chinese that 73 percent had efficient CPM versus in the Indian group had that only 43 percent had uh, um, effective CPM. On the right hand side, on the top, Yumida out of San Antonio, Texas, uh, compared uh, young adults, uh, non Hispanic whites, and Hispanic uh, young adults, and uh, looked at conditioning um, uh, pain modulation, condition pain modulation, excuse me, and they did not find any significant differences between the Hispanic and non Hispanic whites in the test pain intensity the pressure pain ratings, or the CPM effect. Morris, out of Vanderbilt University in uh, Nashville in uh, the United States, um, looked at um, a, a, a youngsters and the average age of uh, four, 15 years old, uh, non-Hispanic bites and African-Americans. And they found that African-American youth had lower temperature to elicit pain 60. However, African-American youth in their sample, had a more efficient CPM response in comparison to non-Hispanic whites. And I would like to urge you to take very great care in interpreting these, these results as a, in the test uh, stimulus uh, modality may be different in an, another study or uh, the group may be just a little bit different in another study and they will find uh, different findings. So you should always very be very careful in these type of interpretations. Then there are the hidden things in life, like psychological factors. And uh, Hadas Nachman Averbuch out of the Technion did a meta-analysis about the psychological factors and condition pain modulation. And they assessed papers in which a CPM was tested on healthy participants or in patients. And they found in total 33, excuse me, 37 studies uh, at that time where data, uh, there was data for psychological variables and they uh, analyze variables for which they have at least 10 studies per subgroup, so per uh, type of uh, psychological factor 
and per uh, patient versus healthy. And if we look at these results, and I apologize for the resolution of this image, but this is the way I uh, copy and pasted it from the uh, study itself, um, but you can see that the diamonds at the bottom of each uh, uh, each list uh, are crossing the midline, and that means uh, that there are no significant uh, effects that were found between these variables and the healthy or and and the and the patients. Disappointing. However, when they looked a little bit deeper into the healthy uh, population they found when correlating it to uh, the testing modality of the CPM, they did find significant effects and they found that higher anxiety level correlates to more efficient CPM when pressure pain is used. And when higher uh, levels of depression are present, they correlate to lower CPM efficacy when heat pain is used and that higher level of pain catastrophizing correlate to more efficient CPM when electrical pain is used. And I would like to urge you to um, visit all, also her uh, latest uh, re uh, review and meta-analysis by Das Nachman out of 2021, where she found interesting results regarding the conditioning stimulus type. So I will not uh, further mention it, but I'll let you uh, search for yourself. And these are also interesting findings. We are very often asked by specifically by clinicians, do you have normative data? Can I use normative data for my protocol? Well, normative data, as you can see, there are so many different protocols, so many different ways to test CPM and so little consistency between the labs that there is um, that these um, efforts have been hampered in the past. Schliesbach, out of Insel uh, Spital in Bern, Switzerland, uh, had uh, tried their hand at uh, collecting normative data um, from 146 participants, and uh, they did uh, electrical pain threshold, no susceptive, no susceptive withdrawal reflex, and pressure pain threshold with a handheld ergometer. And uh, they repeated the testing this as soon as the cold presser became uh, at the intensity of seven out of 10. And, um, oh, excuse me, pardon. And uh, even though this is a very welcome study uh, that some uh, clinicians are waiting for in order to use CPM, there is some issues with it. As for instance, for the nociceptive withdrawal reflex, they were unable to elicit it in about half of their sample as um, uh, half of the participants could not bear the intensity of the stimulus and did not reach uh, the nociceptive withdrawal reflex. And 10% of the pain-free subjects had negative CPM. They had facilitation effects in uh, pressure pain threshold and nociceptive withdrawal re reflex. And in even 25% of the participants did not show an increase in electrical uh, pain threshold during the cold pressure test. And so this goes against the notion that, uh, or, you know, we, patients have uh, inefficient and, and, and healthy have efficient CPM. And uh, this would very much hamper uh, the ability to diagnose somebody uh, as a, a pain patient just based on their uh, CPM results. As you know, you see that healthy people also have facilitation. And these are the results uh, that they had. And uh, it is definitely an interesting study. And of course, one of the limitations as well is that not all labs choose to use this protocol. And um, so this is one of the things that is very interesting. Uh, however, I'm, I think we are not there yet with regard to normative data or the use of normative data in the clinic and clinical outcomes. That's what we are all about. We are always interested to know whether whatever we're testing has any influence or is is uh, of any clinical interest because uh, our notion is that we do pain research in order to help patients. And um, I would like to touch upon these subjects, for instance, Dustela uh, out of the Hospital Clinic de Barcelona in Spain uh, looked at uh, 180 patients of, of whom uh, they had uh, 146 patients that did the final analysis uh, before and after total knee arthroplasty, a hard word for me to say. And about 48% of the patients showed at baseline an ineffective inhibition. 
and they found no association between CPM and other variables like uh, sex and age and pain intensity. They did find that the probability to develop persistent post-operative pain at six months was significantly higher for patients with ineffective CPM, 31%, uh, than for patients with effective CPM, that would be 12% of those patients. Boye Larsen, out of Aalborg in Denmark, followed 131 patients who were to undergo total knee arthroplasty, on this time I didn't say it right, uh, before and up to 12 months after surgery. And they used uh, um, two pressure cuffs. And they found that preoperative CPM is correlated to postoperative pain at 12 months after total knee arthroplasty. However, it was not an independent risk factor, the combination between the preoperative pain and the uh, pain uh, catastrophizing uh, scale score. And the CPM is ex explained about 20% of the variance in the follow up pain. So we talked about um, chronic pain after surgery, and can we predict it? But then it, there is Golsen out of Aarhus University in uh, Denmark. And in this study, they took healthy men who were going to undergo corrective surgery for pectus excavatum, as you can see in this picture on the right. And uh, they tested CPM and psychological factors uh, with a follow-up at, at six months post-surgery. And uh, 15 out of the 46 patients reported pain at six months. However, these patients were not different in terms of CPM. CPM, however, did predict uh, the morphine consumption directly after surgery. So now we're talking about CPM and post-surgery pain, right, perioperatively. Uh, peri so this is an interesting thing to consider. And then there is pharmaceutical treatment and on the uh, top left side, and I, this is a very much cited paper by Janitski out of the Technion in Haifa, he treated patients with uh, painful by diabetic neuropathy with duloxetine in a crossover study. And he found that CPM effect was the independent predictor of treatment efficacy. And those that had deficient CPM um, uh, had a greater drug efficacy effect after uh, using duloxetine for a while. On the right hand side, uh, Dr. Marika Nistos out of Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands uh, took a group of diabetic polyneuropathy patients and treated them with either placebo or tapentadol uh, for four weeks. And the four weeks treatment of tapentadol caused a significant increase in CPM efficacy, which coincided with pain relief in these patients receiving tapentadol. Edwards, on the other hand, uh, uh, out of Harvard Medical School, um, treated uh, patients uh, of, uh, with uh, knee osteoarthritis with topical diclofenac for uh, one month. And um, they found that CPM was a unique predictor of the activity-related pain, as well as the pain diary at the end of the treatment. But in this case, a little bit different from uh, Janitski and Nisters, they found that higher CPM at the baseline was a uh, was a predictor for a better treatment response. So how much does CPM have to do with our clinical pain? And uh, Fernandez uh, in 2019 did a systemic review and uh, looked at um, CPM and its correlation to clinical factors, uh, like for instance, uh, clinical pain intensity or uh, the amount of the number of body sites that are involved uh, that are painful. And they found that two thirds of the study, there was no significant correlation between the pain intensity and the CPM response as well. And a third, there were significant negative correlations between the pain intensity and the CPM response, meaning the more efficient the CPM, the lower the pain. In a great, the great majority of the studies that they evaluated, they found that the pain duration had no significant correlation to the CPM response. That's uh, about uh, 83%. And equally so, pain-related disability in a number of painful sites was not significantly correlated to CPM. And now I want you to pay attention. They found that the majority of the studies that used thermal test and thermal conditioning stimulus revealed more significant negative correlations between CPM responses and clinical manifestations. And this is something that you may want uh, to look at specifically when you're looking at clinical pain manifestations in a clinical group. So 
this is a takeaway message that I find um, that just gives just a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. And then, uh, so we we concluded that we want to have um, an effective CPM, right? We don't want to have chronic pain. We would like, we all like to have effective CPM. Well, not in all cases, apparently. Uh, Granot out of 2015 um, uh, did a study on patients coming into Rambam's Medical Center's intensive care unit after their first ST elevation myocardial infarction, their heart attack. And they had four, uh, 67 patients completing their studies. And what they looked at was how long does it take for you to seek medical attention? And apparently, if you look at the top right graph, you can see that people that had intense pain, makes sense, right? Uh, went to the hospital much faster than those that had mild pain or moderate pain. That they took their time, they consulted their wife, they packed their, you know, and they uh, reached the hospital much later. And of course, we know that uh, in specific uh, medical situations like a heart attack, it, uh, it's, um, you know, it's very, it's a good idea to come as soon as you can. But then they looked at, uh, does this uh, pain intensity have anything to do, or does uh, coming late to the hospital have anything to do with CPM in these patients? And they actually found that those that had less effective CPM uh, arrived at the hospital much earlier than those that had a more effective CPM effect. And you can see that at the top bottom graph. And I think this is an interesting uh, finding, uh, something to keep in mind. Now, the paradoxical finding is that we thought, okay, uh, chronic pain patients, they, uh, as long as you're a chronic pain patient, the, the longer you're suffering, that probably your CPM is going to go down. Well, no. Uh, Granovsky out of when, uh, the Technion here in Israel uh, in 2017 published this paper where they looked at the duration of uh, painful diabetic neuropathy and they looked at the pain duration specifically. And they found that uh, patients who had a short pain duration, less than two years, had um, less effective CPM, even facilitation, than those who had a long pain duration. If you can see the left graph in gray, the long pain duration uh, patients look very much like the healthy controls when it comes to CPM. And then uh, we wonder, okay, so um, does it matter if I have painful diabetic neuropathy versus non-painful diabetic neuropathy? And again, uh, Granovsky and uh, a group from the Imperial College in London uh, took a quite a large group of patients, 271 to be exact, and um, uh, did it uh, three times PPT and uh, tonic heat as well at pain 50 and the conditioning bath. And uh, they did not find any significant differences between the two groups in uh, CPM uh, based on pressure pain threshold. However, they did find significant differences between painful and painless diabetic neuropathy in heat CPM. And uh, patients with painful diabetic neuropathy had more effective C heat CPM than those with painless diabetic neuropathy. And this is again uh, an interesting result. One of the pioneers uh, implementing clinical use of uh, QST and CPM in their pain practice is uh, Professor Albert de Haan out of Leiden University Medical Center. And he, um, he is telling about uh, their, his technique and his consideration in an interesting webinar that was held uh, together with Medoc uh, a while ago. And uh, this webinar is available on our website. I would very much recommend you going there and, and, and watching this webinar together with Marie Canisters and uh, Monique van Velzen. Uh, they speak of the use of CPM and the use of uh, QST and, um, and you know, having uh, using that in their um, treatment consideration of pain patients in their pain clinic. And I think it's, it's a wonderful thing and it should be noted. So uh, here at Medoc, we try to um, support uh, pain research and um, we try to uh, and strive to uh, develop um, devices that are as standardized as possible that give uh, um, good uh, standardized and validated and repeatable stimulus 
And uh, one of them is, for instance, the algorithm, and the algorithm is a pressure pay, uh, pay, uh, pressure algometer, which uh, gives the user the ability to control the stimulus very precisely. And you can see on the pink line, and that's the uh, st the stimulus going up, where the pressure is increased, and uh, you can have a feedback of how well you perform the test, and you can have the average, the standard deviation, and all the test results, and you can compare those. And I think it's a nice um, device to think about. And then there are thermal devices uh, from right to left are uh, QSENS, and always a nice and portable device that gives uh, um, um, that can use be used in a, a test stimulus or a conditioning stimulus with. Uh, with a SIR mode, then there is the TSA2, uh, which uh, is our platform to which you can uh, connect several types of thermos. You can connect even two thermos at the same time, and you can use two thermos and, uh, uh, for instance, do CPM with two thermos. And then uh, there is uh, our baby of the family, the TSA2 Air, sitting next to Masha and our Ronnie. And, uh, this is a device just introduced, and, and it could also serve you in the, as the test stimulus or as the conditioning stimulus. And using a two thermal TPM uh, could have the, its advantages in the sense that you can time it very precisely, the test stimulus and the conditioning stimulus. Uh, there is no um, uh, watching the stopwatch or um, uh, wondering if uh, enough time has passed. Uh, there is the ability to monitor, uh, to, to use it in many different body sites. Uh, not all body sites can uh, be put in the cold bath, for instance. And uh, you can, of course, also use it in the scanner with uh, specific uh, MRI thermodes. And uh, in these COVID times, we all of us are very hygienic and sanitary, and we can clean it quite easily with uh, alcohol sw uh, swipe. I just want to show you what uh, dual thermode uh, use would look like in our software. And this is the pink line going up is the uh, stimulation intensity at 45 degrees. And it will stay there for another 22 seconds. And you can see that on the top where it counts down. The uh, orange line, line that you can still see lingering around the baseline, this will be the secondary thermal that will kick in in about 34 seconds. And then you can see that on the countdown on the right. And you're probably wondering what the blue line is all about. The blue line is the uh, computerized visual analog scale that I used in this case. And it allows you a very, very high resolution uh, temporal um, pain rating. So uh, the uh, participants get a little device with a, 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 something to hold, and then they can um, move it from left to right. Uh, on a scale from uh, 0 to 100, and this will give you uh, the pain rating. And here the conditioning stimulus is going down to 0, but you can have it going up to 46 degrees as well. So it really is up to you if you want to have a, a cold test pain uh, and, and, or a an warm conditioning or vice versa. You can The sky is really the limit, and you can very precisely time it and uh, make sure that it is the exact uh, uh, um, amount of time and the exact temperature that you want it to be there. And now uh, the second uh, test pane is coming back up again. You can see me rating the test pane in blue also again. Well, the conditioning st stimulus is still here in the background um, and has its effect on the Test stimulus, and you can see if we uh, look very quickly at the differences between the two blue lines, you can see the difference that the second blue line on the right is much lower than the blue line on the left. And uh, you can, of course, uh, very well calculate it and use area under the curve or take a peak versus nadir. And these are some of the fun stuff that you can do with our devices. Two thermal CPM has been used in several studies, and this is quite a new study out of uh, Syracuse University in New York, out of 2022, uh, where the Vita has used uh, one of our devices to uh, do uh, Q, uh, uh, do two ther thermal CPM, and he used actually quite a unique um, paradigm where the, the 
test stimulus was, was continuous, and then the conditioning stimulus kicked in, and it was rated using, using the COVAS that you can see here on the left. And he found quite a good um, uh, test, free test repeatability uh, within a week. So uh, the patient participants came in uh, seven days from each other. Of course, our devices are also used in, not necessarily in chronic pain patients, but also looking at, uh, for instance, psychiatric disorders like here in a non suicidal self injury. And they did uh, two thermal CPM and they found that uh, patients had ineffective CPM on the bottom row of the table. Well, healthy had effective CPM, and this was a um, significant finding. This is a classical example of two thermal TPM. Why? Because you cannot put somebody's head in the cold water bath. And they did a two thermal TPM on two places on the face, on the face and the neck, and on the neck and the shoulder, because they wanted to see whether um, the trigeminal area is affected by CPM, yes or no, because headaches are the second most prevalent chronic uh, pain uh, condition after low back pain. And they actually found that uh, when uh, any uh, stimulus is included within the trigeminal area, CPM is ineffective versus when none of the stimuli are in included in the trigeminal area. And you can see that at the bottom graph in black. So a very nice example, I think. I want to summarize by saying that there are many roads leading to Rome and there's many, many ways to achieve CPM, and this is really uh, much uh, a deliberation within your lab and also something that you want to look at. Uh, for instance, uh, you may want to include controls since uh, there is very little or maybe uh, normative data that is uh, not necessarily relevant to your paradigm. Uh, I would also want to urge you to look at differences within your group and between the groups uh, and look at confounding variables that may affect these. And I didn't even mention all the variables that may affect, for instance, sleep. And the paradigm choice, we talked about parallel versus sequential and, and pressure pain threshold. We talked about uh, heat pain uh, or the, using a thermal stimulus as the heat, uh, as the test and the conditioning stimulus and that this is uh, more often correlated to uh, clinical um, variables. So this is also something that you may want to consider and uh, research a little bit. And uh, with regard to clinical use, I would really you know, be very happy if CPM would be a part of uh, the way we look at patients. Uh, and uh, if, but I think there is still a long way to go with regard to the, um, the, the research that we need to have behind it. And, um, um, but of course, uh, pain research is always focused on bettering uh, chronic pain patients and pain patients' lives. And that's something that we all keep in mind when we uh, discuss pain and when we research pain. I want to thank you for your time. And I think we, we may have some time for um, some questions. And I'll look at uh, the questions that you wrote uh, wrote down and see if there are any any questions that you may want to ask me. So th this is your uh, chance to write a question, and if you, you know, if you don't come up with a question right now and you you remember it a little bit later, uh, don't hesitate to write, drop us a line and, and write us an email, and, and we'll be happy to uh, to uh, to answer your questions. Um, um, Deborah, uh, you asked whether um, the there are studies that shows positive influence on CPM uh, on the long term, um, positive influence of, uh, um, for instance, of, for instance, an, um, um, an, an intervention or medical intervention, uh, there are, um, I'm not sure whether there is a long-term effect that was um, reported, for instance, by Janitsky on Nisters. I think no, I think the, their data collection uh, ended at the end of the treatment uh, of, in, of the pharmaceutical treatment uh, for that, those studies. 
Uh, I do know, for instance, that there are effects uh, on CPM, for instance, uh, there is um, a study on, done on total knee arthropathy and also total hip arthropathy in people suffering from uh, osteoarthritis. And they found that at baseline, uh, these patients had um, an ineffective, uh, in average, right, ineffective CPM as compared to uh, uh, the healthy, and that after uh, um, pain relief by uh, this uh, operation, that uh, their uh, CPM um, efficacy uh, even slightly or uh, totally normalized. So this is also an interesting finding. This may say that uh, you know all may not be lost if we can treat pain better, then our uh, uh, CPM will improve. And we do need to remember that uh, CPM is and uh, you know is tested with experimental pain. And this is uh, experimental pain is not clinical pain. And this is also something that you always have to keep in mind that you're putting up a situation that is not necessarily natural. And, um, you know, that you, you have to take it maybe just a little bit with a grain of salt. Um, for those, um, for those logging off, thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And um, yeah, if you fill in your feedback and you have uh, suggestions for other webinars, we'll be very happy to hear about that and 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 dive into the literature and, and you know and and give another uh, maybe interesting presentation.